Good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here and participate, and it's an always humbling experience for me to see all these people give testimonies and describe their plights that they've had and realize how lucky I am that I can serve people with, of such courage and uh, humility. And it, it's truly, I think, a, a pleasure for me as a medical oncologist to, to help people. And medical oncology, a good medical oncologist, is not an easy field, especially in pancreatic. So I think that you have to be not just a good oncologist, but you also have to be a, a good internal medicine, in general internist, because cancer goes anywhere in the body. And you also have to be a good psychiatrist. And as John Chabot said, listening to the patient is probably the most essential thing you can do and, and, tell, and have a good rapport with your patient. And we do that very well here at the Pancreas Center. I'm going to try to talk briefly about uh, some of the chemotherapy advances that I hope will give more hope to people and how some of them came from our institution. This is just a list of people that uh, are involved in the everyday uh, machinations in the medical oncology, including our clinical research and some of our laboratory research. But there are many people here who have very importantly uh, taken care of patients, in particular Bill Sherman, who is uh, one of the senior faculty members, and some of our junior faculty members that are coming up, such as Dr. Yomi Lee, and also the fellows that are very much interested in pancreatic cancer. So basically, these three regimens, GTX, GAX, and ICM, were all developed here uh, at Columbia within our laboratories. And I'm not going to go much into the mechanisms because of time, but basically GTX and GAX are very similar in that they induce synergistic apoptosis based on certain pe chemical pathways. They increase the uh, MAP, they inhibit the MAP kinase pathway, which is very important in every mutant RAS cancer, which occurs in 90, 75 to 95 percent of all pancreatic cancers. And it also, in these GTX and GAX regimens, uh, increase this transporter for GEMSAR so that GEMSAR, which is one of the major drugs in pancreatic cancer, gets into the cell more efficiently. The GAX regimen, which some of you uh, heard about but don't know of, is simply a, it's going to be a further, um, I think, improvement of the GTX regimen. And we're sub substituting a drug called Abraxane, which many of you have probably heard of, uh, for Taxotere. And Abraxane data will be coming out in a month or two, but it's going to be the most potent um, Taxane-type drug there is. And I think it'll make, uh, it'll be, our responses, at least in our preliminary pilot study, have even been more impressive than GTX. The next regimen is called ICM, and the ICM regimen just actually opened up about two days ago, and we are now accepting patients into this um, National Cancer Institute study. But most of the time, most of these, uh, but this regimen was really designed for people with genetic-induced pancreatic cancer for whatever mutation, whether it's a BRCA or a non-BRCA, but if it occurs in younger people, um, many times those are the ones that are genetically related, as Dr. Castrinas will talk about. And in our small study so far in the BRCA-positive patients who have pancreatic cancer, our response rates were amazingly very high, 75% in that small study. So we're increasing this study now um, the next two or three years. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I'm not going to go through this complex table uh, again, but basically I, what, what I want to show you is that if you look at the panel of Gemzar Tarsiva, you can see from Gemzar Tarsiva to Furanox, GTX, GAX, and ICM that our response rates are increasing. In fact, Fulfirinox really was an important regimen that came along. It's a phase three tested regimen from France that had the first median survival that was over 11 months. It was 11.2 months. And 50% of their patients lived over one year. These are patients with metastatic disease to the liver. And that was, oh, excuse me, that was certainly better than any of these other regimens that had uh, preceded it. The problem with the Fulfirinox regimen is this. It's extraordinarily toxic, as uh, my patient Ron Ivins will talk about next. The GTX regimen 
gives you very similar response rates as fulfirinox. It gives you equivalent um, survival. In fact, our survival in our current study that uh, we're publishing is over a year, 14 and a half months. Plus, we had one other study with GTX, which was 11.2 months, and then 150 patients at Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, was studied with GTX, and they confirmed our results that this regimen is as good, if not better, than fulfirinox, but importantly, it's much less toxic, and that's what's uh, I think significant is that GTX does not have to uh, hurt the patient to get a beneficial effect. In fact, I'd say half of my patients on GTX work, at least 50%, if not 100% of the time. The GAX regimen has just been tested and it looks like it even has better responses. However, this is a small pilot study and we don't know these other factors yet. Uh, the ICM regimen, particularly in people with BRCA mutation, is extremely powerful and looks very exciting. And then a regimen that will be coming out in December called Abraxane Gemzar that was done by Dr. Dan Van Hoff at University of Arizona is also very exciting and it shows a 40% response rate, median survival of about a year, over 50% of your patients are living one year. So as it stands today in the world of chemotherapy, the three regimens that give you approximately one year average survival are Abraxane, Gemzar, GTX, and Fulfirinox. The difference is the toxicities. This is certainly the most toxic, Fulfirinox. What about the neoadjuvant setting? That is a situation where a patient is not operable and requires chemotherapy and radiation prior to having surgery. So if we just look at the uh, current standard of care, this is Gemzar and radiation. About a quarter of the patients become, uh, will, will shrink, and about 20 to 25 percent will have clean margins. The median survival is listed here. It's a little over a year. And the problem with this regimen is that while the patients are getting treated, 30 percent will progress on treatment and therefore fail. The Fulfirinox regimen has not been tested yet with radiation. It's a very toxic regimen, so be very careful to test that, but that, that is in progress. Results are not known. But our studies that we've done with radiation and, and uh, GTX show a very high response rates in our current prospective phase two study. We had a 50% clear margin, which means at the Whipple there were negative margins for tumor, and that's what you need. And in our retrospective study, we had a 62% clear margin. And in a study done by Johns Hopkins, again, confirming our results, showing 67% of the patients had clear margins. And our survivals were actually pushed out. So the, the way the evolution of these regimens is going, it looks like there's more and more responses and more survival. And the other thing about GTX and radiation that we're very excited about is this. The number of patients who failed in our three trials are 4% in our first trial, 4% at Johns Hopkins trial, and 0% failed or progressed while on treatment trying to get this radiation chemotherapy before surgery. So we're very excited about that because nothing has ever, the average is about 30% across the board at many other major institutions. In the adjuvant setting, that is after surgery, if you don't do something after surgery, many times you will fail, and these are old uh, statistics. Over about 90% of the patients will actually relapse after a Whipple. Those were 20-year-old uh, data. As we've evolved from 5-FU to GEMSAR, let's just look at the GEMSAR. 75% of people who get six months of GEMSAR alone, which is the standard of care today, will still fail. They'll relapse. The tumor comes back. And the median survival is measured here 22.4 months, which was only about 2.2 2, 2 months longer than 5-FU. Fulfirinox, the data is not in. I'm sure it will prolong, it'll decrease this number substantially, but in a uh, study that's ongoing right now at the P uh, Pancreas Center at Columbia, our GTX, six months of GTX after a Whipple, currently at 18 months, gives you a 30% failure rate. So these numbers are decreasing nicely, and this actually represents, I think, a major uh, impact of GTX in the post-Whipple uh, population. So in summary, 
There's been a lot of progress made in chemotherapy at our institution as well as many other institutions. Uh, Fulfirinox is je definitely a great regimen. It is powerful. It is also very toxic and should only be used in people that are younger and those with excellent performance status. Um, but the regimens across the board for metastatic, neoadjuvant, and adjuvant are all improving survival. The GTX regimen, I guess that's my clue to finish. <laughs> the GTX regimen is probably as good, if not better, I'll just say perhaps better, than Fulfirinox because it's not been tested in phase three trial, but what is known is that it's much less toxic and you have better quality of life. The three regimens that have been designed here at this uh, institution have all been rationally designed, directly translated from the lab, which is how I think is the best way regimens should be designed in pancreatic cancer, and unfortunately, that's not done that way most of the time. And the new therapies that we are working on in different laboratories that look promising are listed here. One is AAA, which doesn't include any chemotherapy whatsoever. It's arsenic, uh, ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, and antabuse, which kills pancreatic cancer cells. There's a new gene therapy that's being developed for pancreatic cancer that's very specific for pancreatic cancer. Um, we also been able to induce a BRCA deficiency in normal, pan normal pancreatic cancer cells that makes them more sensitive to other chemotherapy drugs and PARP inhibitors. Uh, the P53 peptide work continues, and that P53 peptide is something that is non-toxic to normal cells, but it kills P53 mutant cells, which occurs in about 85% of all pancreatic cancer cells. And then the last thing is the finding that Tarceva actually can cause stable disease in people with wild-type BRCA, wild-type KRAS, and those type of patients in the majority have BRCA mu uh, mutation. So what I'd like to do is stop here and have my patient, Ron Ivins, come up and give us his experience with Fulfirinox and with GTX.